Welcome to Bible Breath, where we dig into the Word of God to catch our breath for whatever is coming next. Today we continue to talk about who God is according to God. It seems like we've been talking about this for a while, but there's a lot to discover about God. And today we're going to start with the first of two lessons where we talk about God, the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about the necessity of the Holy Spirit and also the reality of the Holy Spirit. You may remember that the Bible teaches somewhat complex teaching on who God is. God is three persons, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. The Son is not the Father or the Holy Spirit. They are each their own person, and yet they are each fully 100% God. Just think about Jesus' baptism. We referred to Jesus' baptism in a previous lesson where all three persons of the Trinity revealed themselves in some way. God the Son walked into the water to be baptized. God the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And God the Holy Spirit, well, he descended over Jesus in the form of a dove, which is about as visible as the Holy Spirit ever gets. For the most part, the Holy Spirit is pretty invisible and works behind the scenes, but that doesn't mean he isn't incredibly significant. To illustrate that, I would like you to do something. I'd like you to breathe. Take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. Now you can't see your breath unless you're standing outside where it's really, really cold right now. But typically you can't see your breath. And yet your breath is a sign of life. And that's kind of like the Holy Spirit. So you can't see the Holy Spirit with your eyes, but you see evidence of where the Holy Spirit brings life. The Bible compares the work of the Holy Spirit to, to, to a breath or to the wind. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit, it says in John chapter 3. And of course, if a breath is powerful enough, then it becomes a very powerful wind and a wind that can affect incredible change. My son and I just had to remove some fence panels from our backyard because we had some very large, about eight foot by eight foot fence panels that had been knocked over by the wind. And as we were carrying them, we, uh, we realized that these are pretty heavy duty fence panels and it wasn't just a very small wind that knocked these things down. It was a very big wind, a very large wind. And in order for those to be knocked down, it had to be a very large wind. And large winds, they can affect, they can affect a lot of change. And I want you to think about that in relation to the world today. That as you think about the world, what in the world would you identify as something that needs to change? You might come up with any number of possible things. But I'm going to guess that everybody's answer has to do with one category. And that category is people. People need to change. We see that in the number of abusive relationships there are in the world. We see that in the sad reality of school shootings. We see it in corporate greed and private greed. You see it in your individual life with people who've treated you with a lack of love. And you maybe have even seen it in yourself. So that you look in the mirror and you think, I need to change. I need to become different. I need to become better. Well, this is why the work of the Holy Spirit is such an important gift that God gives us and such a necessary gift for all of us. As we dig into the work in the Holy Spirit, we're going to re be reviewing quite a bit from previous lessons, so bear with me. We'll try to go somewhat quickly since a lot of it is review, but it's laying a lot of the groundwork for our understanding just who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, and how we know he's really, really working. Let's review the, one of the most famous Bible passages of all, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Reviewing the lesson that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the entire world. Everybody in the world. Every single individual who will ever live. 
In 1 John chapter 2, it says that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Every single person, the bill on every single person's sins has been paid. It doesn't matter who they are or where they lived. And yet, even though all of their sins have been paid for, not everyone ends up being saved. Remember, Jesus said it himself in Matthew 25, and in the last day, some will go away to eternal punishment, but some will go away to eternal life. And the difference is what we heard the Apostle Paul tell the jailer at Philippi. The difference is those who believe in the Lord Jesus will be saved, and those who do not believe will, will be condemned. Jesus once told a story to illustrate that, about uh, the reality that, that all are invited, but not everyone gets in. Now it's in Luke chapter 14. It's one of his parables. Parable of the Great Banquet, it's titled, where somebody is hosting a great banquet and he goes out and invites so many different people. Lots of food, lots of fun, lots of resources for everybody to enjoy. He says, come now, everything is ready. But then it shows us some of the answers that that person received from the individuals who had been invited. And one said, well, you know, I, I just bought a field and I need to go and enjoy it. I, um, I just bought five yoke of oxen, another one said, and I need, uh, I need to work them. I got lots of important work to do. Or another one said, well, I just got married, so I can't come. I got to do, do something else. And those aren't bad things in and of themselves, buying a field and having oxen. And of course, getting married is not a bad thing. That's a very, very good thing. And yet all of those things, they consider to be more important than going to the banquet. And Jesus' conclusion was, it's like, well, all of those who are on the outside of heaven looking in, in the end, it will be for one reason, because they decided that something else in this world was more important than the eternal banquet with God. And apparently people will have many different excuses and many different reasons that they will have kept themselves out of that. And honestly, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Not at all. Not when we consider how the Bible describes how every person comes into this world from the very beginning. Another review point that we had a number of lessons ago was one of the sad results of sin. Ephesians chapter 2 says, you know, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We are born spiritually dead. We have no ability or desire to live for God. It's like, um, it's like a human corpse. Can't just decide all on its own. I'm going to be, I'm going to be awake and I'm going to be alive. In the same way, somebody who is spiritually dead as the Bible says we all are from the very beginning. They can't just suddenly decide, well, I'm going to go and serve God. I'm going to go and live a good life. I'm going to go and worship God and tell other people about him. No, because they are spiritually dead. And that's not the only way that the Bible describes our natural condition from the moment that, from the moment that we come into this world. The Bible also describes us in a sense of being spiritually blind. The Apostle Paul, one time, he was describing to some people that he was around, Part of his conversation, he was, he was sharing part of the conversation that Jesus had with Paul on the day that he converted Paul. And Jesus said to Paul, he said, he said, I'm sending you out to unbelievers to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. So basically saying that those who don't believe in Jesus, it's like their eyes are closed. It's like they're wearing a blindfold. They are not able to see anything good about Jesus, anything good about God's word. And according to the Bible, that is the natural condition of every single person who comes into this, who comes into the world. Spiritually dead, spiritually blind, and also one more. In Romans chapter 8, it also puts a label on all those who do not believe in Jesus. They are spiritually enemies of God. It says this, it says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. The way that people come into this world, they come in with an inclination already, and more than an inclination, it is their entire heart's desire to push God away. And that's how the Bible describes our natural condition since conception. You know, why doesn't everyone just have faith in Jesus? Why isn't it always very simple for everyone to believe in Jesus? Because the simple thing for us from the moment we are conceived is to push God away. Psalm 51, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And this leads to one of our Bible buzzwords. And the Bible buzzword is our natural condition. We are spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God from the moment of our conception. We are spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God from the moment of our conception. 
Those are the things that are easy for us. And that means three very important things for us. If we are spiritually blind, it means that we'll always have a hard time, even more than that, an impossible time on our own, understanding the simple message of the gospel. You know, just imagine you don't know Chinese, and yet you go somewhere and you see something that's written in Chinese. You can see the symbols. You can maybe even copy them on a piece of paper, but if you don't know the Chinese language, you will have no understanding of what that means. Even if you see, saw something familiar like John 3.16, if you didn't know Chinese, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter because you wouldn't be able to understand what the message, what the message was. The Bible applies this same kind of thing to unbelievers from the moment of our conception, that because we're blind, we don't understand the simple message. It says, unbelievers will be ever hearing, but never understanding. They'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we go out into this world and we see people who have a hard time getting the gospel or people who push, push it away because they're frustrated with the lack of understanding. That's actually the more natural response to the gospel according to the Bible. And we also shouldn't be surprised when we ourselves have that type of experience, when we're the ones who are reading the Bible and we have a hard time seeing what's in there. We have a hard time understanding what God is saying. Again, that is the easy thing for us to do because of our natural condition. Second thing that this means, that we are spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God from conception, it means that because we are enemies of God, we don't naturally see value in what Jesus did. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, he said, the message of the cross, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. It doesn't make sense. They look at Christians and they think they're absolutely, absolutely ludicrous for believing what they do about Jesus and about the gospel and about heaven and hell and, and sin and grace and, and all those different and all those different things. And again, because this is the natural condition of every person, it, don't be surprised if somebody ever pushes back at you on account of your faith. That's the natural, naturally easy thing for every single person to do because that's naturally inborn in us from conception. And number three, because we are naturally spiritually dead, we can't simply choose to believe in Jesus. Like we can't just flip the switch one day and say, oh, well, now, now I'm a believer. You know, Jesus said it to his disciples in John chapter 15. He said, he said, you guys didn't choose me. I chose you. If somebody is spiritually dead, like somebody who's physically dead, they don't have the ability to just do something different other than be dead. And so you have to be careful here. Some people have the impression that in order to do mission work, you gotta go out into the world and you gotta tell people to believe in Jesus. You gotta tell people to accept Jesus. You gotta tell people to choose, to choose to have faith. And you just, you have to be really, really careful that you don't put an impossible burden on somebody's shoulders. Because if somebody is spiritually dead, blind, and an enemy of God, then really they don't have the ability to suddenly open their eyes on their own, to suddenly wake up on their own, and to suddenly love God on their own. Now, some might hear that and they might think, well, hold on, time out. What about the jailer at Philippi? We've talked about him. And when the jailer at Philippi came to the Apostle Paul and he said, what must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul told him, well, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus. I mean, doesn't that kind of imply that that's the way that we should go and do mission work? That we should try to get people into the kingdom of God, go out and tell them to wake up spiritually and to believe and to believe in Jesus? Let's take a look at the larger context, the larger scriptural context around what happened in the jailer at Philippi. Remember that Paul and Silas, they were out preaching the gospel, they were doing missionary work, and they were thrown in prison because of it. And when they were in prison, one night, as the guard was on guard, guarding them, suddenly there was an earthquake, and all the doors of all the jail cells, they flew open. And the jailer came rushing in, and he was really, really scared when he saw all the doors open, because he knew that if those prisoners escaped on his watch, he was going to be in big, big trouble. And so he was going to end his own life. But before he was able to follow through on that, the Apostle Paul shouted from the jail cell. He said, don't do it. We're all here. We're all here. And the jailer came running to Paul's cell. He brought them out of the cell and he said, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now, the Apostle Paul knew something about that, something that he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he is the one who said, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So the Apostle Paul would have known in saying, believe when he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, that something needed to happen to that person's heart before he would be able to willingly say something like that. Remember in a previous lesson, another review thing, we talked about how somebody who is physically dead, when their heart stops, they don't have the ability to get their heart going again. The, uh, the doctors will often take the, uh, the little shocker thingies and charge them up with electricity, and then, they will, and then they'll put them on the person's chest and, and try to shock life back into the heart so that it starts beating, all, it starts beating on its own. But it doesn't start beating without that outside force that is giving it the ability to start beating. That's what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 12 when he says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like the shockers, not to our physical heart, but to our spiritual heart. And so the Apostle Paul would have known that. And it makes sense when you look at what Paul and Silas were doing that compelled the jailer at Philippi to ask them what he needed to do to be saved. Because it tells us that about, about midnight, when they were in prison, before the earthquake came, it says the Apostle Paul and, they were, and Silas, they were praying and they were singing hymns to God. A hymn is a song that tells a story about God. And so they were singing about God sharing the message of God. And according to the Bible, it's through the hearing of that message, it's through the sharing of that message that faith comes, that the Holy Spirit gets into a person's heart and gets that heart beating again. You know, Romans chapter 10, consequently it says, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And so just note the order of events there. Paul and Silas, they shared the message of the gospel and the hymns that they were singing. The man came to them terrified and asked, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle Paul told him to do something that now he believed he might possibly have the ability to do because the Holy Spirit <laughs> shocked his spiritual heart through the message that they were, that through the message that they were sharing. You know, this is how somebody comes to saving faith. It's through the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit's job. In 2 Thessalonians 2, the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends, We always ought to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The Bible gives credit to the Holy Spirit for anybody being saved because it's the Holy Spirit's job to create faith. And there's one other aspect of it that we've already touched on in previous lessons, that's important to emphasize. That creation of faith, your ability to believe in Jesus and not consider God an enemy, your ability to see Jesus as the wonderful Savior that he is, it's a gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to go through the checklist to make sure you do everything just the right way. It's just a gift. And it's a gift that is given by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible also describes the work of the Holy Spirit in other ways. It uh, talks about the work of conversion. Conversion is literally you're going in one direction and then suddenly you start going in the other direction. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You're going in a direction that leads us to hell, but the Holy Spirit turns us around and suddenly leads us to heaven. The Bible talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in the sense of us being born again, not born physically again, but born spiritually physical birth, but then a spiritual birth, the birth of coming to faith. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And just like you had nothing to do with you being physically born, you also have nothing to do with you being spiritually born. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible also talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in the sense of being enlightened, like a light bulb has just gone, uh, just has, has just been turned on. So now you can see, whereas previously you, you didn't know that God was good. Now you know. And again, you didn't make that happen. The Holy Spirit did. Regularly, the Bible gives credit to the Holy Spirit for the work of faith that lives inside of your heart. The Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for every individual life because without the Holy Spirit, there is no faith in any person's heart. And so you get to see faith, evidence of that faith in lots of people's lives as you go out. But, but the main question I want you to consider right now is, how do you really know that the Holy Spirit has been really active in your life? To answer that question, you might, you might ask yourself some very important things, maybe three important questions. You might ask yourself, well, does it bother me that I've sinned against the Lord? That's a good question to ask, to recognize our need for forgiveness and our need for a Savior. Does it bother me that I've sinned against the Lord? And you might ask yourself, 
Do I trust that God has cleansed me from all of my sin through the work of Jesus? Also very, very important to know that you value Jesus and you, you, see, you see great benefit in what he did, necessary benefit in all that he did. And question number three, you might ask yourself, do I now have the desire to serve God out of love? You know, in other words, I'm not acting like I'm spiritually blind and dead and an enemy of God. I'm, I'm acting like I'm alive and I can see the good thing that God is. And I have a desire to love him. You might ask yourself those questions. And there's value in asking yourself those questions and doing self-evaluation. Helps us see where we are in the moment. Helps us see room for growth. But there's also a danger to those types of questions that I just at least want you to be aware of. Every one of them will create doubt in some way. Like if you ask yourself, does it bother me that I've sinned against the Lord? Honestly, you'll be able to look back in your life and you'll be able to find times where it didn't bother you at all. Where you were maybe even eager to jump into something and then you'll wonder, well, do I really have faith? Or like, do I trust that God has cleansed me from all sin through the work of Jesus? Maybe sometimes, but maybe there are some times with some sins or some situations you were in or some words that you said or you didn't say where you wonder if you really do trust in God. You'll doubt. And do I have the desire to serve God out of love? Well, sometimes, yeah. Maybe many times. But all the time? I don't know about that. If you were to say that about yourself, I, I'd be skeptical at the very least. When you do a deep evaluation of all the darkest corners of your heart. When you look at your life and how well you, how well you live, how well you trust, how well you serve, how well you love, there's always a little room for doubt, sometimes a lot of room for doubt. And so really the best way to evaluate whether or not you are somebody who is saved is not to look at yourself at all. It's to look at Jesus and ask, well, what did Jesus do? Did Jesus live for me the perfect life that I needed as my substitute? Yeah. Did he die for me on the cross to take away all my sins? Yeah. Did he rise from the dead? Is the guarantee that he was victorious over everything that could keep us from God and his kingdom? Yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt. If you want the certainty that you are saved, spend more time focusing on the work of Jesus than you do focusing on your work. And you'll more regularly find the comfort that Jesus came to give. But finally, if you're worried, remember how it is that faith comes. It comes by the Holy Spirit through the message. And didn't you just spend a good chunk of time today listening to the message? You just did. And maybe you feel great because of it. Maybe you notice an incredible difference right now. But maybe you don't. Maybe you don't feel any differently than you did 15 minutes ago. Maybe you feel the same and you wonder if the Holy Spirit is working, but remember that the Holy Spirit is like a breath. The Holy Spirit is like a wind. You can't always see where it's going. You just know that it always is. And then eventually, that'll show up. Evidence of that breath, evidence of that wind. It will show up. The Holy Spirit is working.